Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute, and production of this episode was made possible by a grant from the Roller Bottomore Foundation of Richmond, Virginia. Henry Gibbs of Connecticut to Roger Sherman, 16th July, 1789. I am far from wishing that the beauty of our new system should be marred by the many preposterous alterations which have been proposed. But as it was adopted by some of the states in full confidence that the subject of amendments would be soon constitutionally entered upon, I hope Congress will not delay canvassing the matter any longer than their more important business renders necessary. All ambiguity of expression certainly ought to be removed. Liberty of conscience in religious matters right of trial by jury, liberty of the press, etc., may, perhaps, be more explicitly secured to the subject and a general reservation made to the states respectively of all the powers not expressly delegated to the general government. These indeed may be thought by most to be the spirit of the Constitution, but there are some who have their fears that the loose manner of expression in some instances will not sufficiently guard the rights of the subject from the invasion of corrupt rulers hereafter. Some such explanatory and reserving clauses may therefore, without giving umbrage to the friends of the new plan of government, tend greatly to conciliate the minds of many of its opponents. As to any essential alterations, neither time nor capacity will allow of my forming an opinion respecting them. and welcome to episode 260 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. How and why did Congress draft the first 10 amendments to the Constitution? The history of American law is in many ways the history of the United States. Where history tells us who we are and how we came to be who we are, The history of American law tells us about power, authority, and governance within the United States and how that power, authority, and governance has changed over time. In the United States, we use the law and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights to understand and define ourselves culturally. Americans, we're a people with laws and rights, rights protected by the Constitution because they are defined in the Constitution. And the place where the Constitution defines and really outlines our rights or our civil liberties is within its first 10 amendments. It's within the Bill of Rights. This episode is the second episode in our fourth Doing History series, a series dedicated to exploring early American history and how historians work. In this fourth Doing History series, we're exploring the early American origins of the Bill of Rights and the history of the Fourth Amendment so that we can better understand where our rights come from how they developed out of the early American past, and the specialized field of legal history. Legal history is a really important field of study. It's a field of study that both historians and lawyers use, and it's a field of study that informs our modern-day American legal system. In this episode, we're investigating how and why Congress drafted the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Our guide for this investigation is Kenneth Bowling, a member of the First Federal Congress Project and a co-editor of a documentary history of the first federal Congress. Now, during our investigation, Ken reveals information about the first federal Congress project and its work to compile 22 published volumes of documents related to the first federal Congress, the origins of the Bill of Rights and how Congress came to amend the constitution and the role documentary editions play in our historical knowledge and in our constitutional history. And now our fourth doing history series continues with an investigation of the first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution. Andrew Moore of Virginia to Archibald Stewart, 18 August, 1789. The subject of amendments, which has been under consideration for some days and was yesterday reported to the House from a committee of the whole. The debates have been lengthy and on yesterday conducted with a great deal of warmth. Those who have been styled anti-federalists, were opposed to the amendments proposed as too immaterial and unimportant. A Mr. Tucker of South Carolina introduced and proposed a long string of very important amendments indeed. They were rejected almost unanimously. I have sent two or three copies of the amendments as introduced by the select committee. I expect they will meet with the concurrence of two-thirds of both houses 
nearly in the form they were introduced. Various opinions prevail here with respect to amendments. All agree that the present cannot impair the necessary energy of government. I think from the sense of the public, as far as it has been collected by the communications from the different states, they will quiet the public mind and remove, in a great measure, the opposition to government. Our guest is a member of the First Federal Congress Project and a co-editor of a documentary history of the First Federal Congress. He has served as a consultant to the National Archives, the National Geographic Society, and the United States Commission on the Bicentennial of the Constitution. He's written numerous articles and books, and he's taught classes at George Washington University. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Kenneth Bowling. Thank you. So, Ken, you're an editor at the First Federal Congress Project. Could you tell us a bit about that project and its work? Okay, well, I'm actually retired now. And the project itself, where I worked for 50 years, was first envisioned by the Sesquicentennial Commission on the Constitution, 1937-1939. And it recommended that by the bicentennial in 1987-89, all the documents related to the ratification of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the First Congress should be gathered by the federal government and published for the use of the American people. So virtually nothing happened until 1950, when Julian Boyd presented the first volume of the papers of Thomas Jefferson to President Truman. Truman then wrote a line item into the federal budget to give money to the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, which was part of the National Archives, for the sole purpose of beginning to collect the documents. They hired someone to do that. A little bit of work was done, but it really wasn't until Lyndon Johnson's Great Society that real money came into the federal budget for the ratification project, which is located at the University of Wisconsin and is still publishing, and the first federal Congress project, which was at George Washington University. The project, the First Federal Congress project, that is, consists of 22 volumes. Those volumes contain the Senate and House journals, three volumes, and then it contains bill history, three volumes. Then we published the debates. Now, our volumes, our debate volumes, include all of the published debate in the newspapers. It also includes Thomas Lloyd's Congressional Register, and it includes Thomas Lloyd's shorthand notes that he took in the uh, House chamber and then later expanded into the congressional record. We also have a volume, very significant volume nine, which is the diary of William McClay, a senator from Pennsylvania. The Senate met in secret. It's the only account we have of what happened in the Senate. And it's very interesting the way he put it together. He took notes on the floor, and then he went home at night and transcribed them into a full account of what had happened that day. There's also a lot of social history, information about New York City in 1789 and 1790 when Congress met there. And then the most interesting part of the volumes, in my opinion, are the final volumes, which are the letters of members, the letters to members, and the newspaper articles that refer to members or what's going on in Congress. There are five of those volumes, I believe. And the final volume is a volume that includes all of the things that we found in the years after publishing the volume in which they would have been included had we had them. So that comes to a total of 22 volumes. It sounds like these 22 volumes of a documentary history of the First Federal Congress are really a definitive collection of all the different documents that were involved in and came from these meetings of the First House of Representatives and the First Senate. 
Yes, and it's a very significant collection. The Supreme Court uses it in cases, both pro and con arguments. And we included everything we found. And I haven't found anything since in the last two years. But it's definitely definitive as to official records and then the unofficial records, which are the debates and the letters. What was the process of document collection like for these volumes? You mentioned newspapers, diaries, little pieces of paper. How did you and the other editors go about locating all of these different types of documents and where did you find them all? Well, it's a long story. So the official records of the Senate and House are stored at the National Archives. They're not actually deposited there. Congress keeps control of them, but lets the executive branch store them. So that was very easy. We got all the records on microfilm of the first Senate, 1789 to 91, and the first House the same years. A few documents had been alienated. And whenever we saw something come up for sale, because we spent a lot of time studying catalogs for the auction markets and also the individual document dealers who didn't hold auctions. And we would try to get copies of these alienated official documents. The Senate records were kept by the Senate Secretary Samuel Allen Otis of Massachusetts, and he kept every single scrap. So we can put together minute detail about the amendments to bills that took place in the Senate. John Beckley, clerk of the House, on the other hand, took the attitude that the more documents he could destroy, the better. So if he had a final copy of something, he destroyed all of the previous documents related to it, all of the drafts, all of the amendments, who proposed the amendment, all that stuff is gone from history. That's the official record. The newspapers, there are approximately 100 newspapers, the majority of which are available in a database, early American newspapers. And we just read every issue of every newspaper. So that's where we found all of the newspaper texts of the debates. And that's where we found articles about members and articles about topics before the first Congress. Also, the weather, we included the weather. But the hardest thing to find was the private letters. And the way we went about it is as follows. In the 1950s, under that first grant from Harry Truman, a staff member from the National Archives was sent out, and he got the cream of the crop from the major manuscript repositories such as Massachusetts Historical, New York Historical, Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Someone else did the same thing for the Library of Congress. But they only looked into collections that they knew about. So beginning in 1970, actually in 1969, with the funding from the Great Society, three different researchers went out. And essentially what we did in that search was to look into every single manuscript collection that contained documents covering the period of the ratification of the Constitution, the first Congress, and the ratification of the Bill of Rights. So any collection having documents 1787 to 1791, we opened the collection and took a look. So we found hundreds, thousands of letters that were not known to the uh, projects because the original collection was only skimming the surface in the major collections. So we increased the manuscript letters from one vertical file to seven vertical files just for the first Federal Congress project. Then in 1989, First Federal Congress Project hired Chuck DiGiacomantonio, a young graduate of the University of Chicago, to come on board the project. And he made the strong case that it's not just about white men, it's about the whole social 
history of the first Congress and the familial history, what was happening, how many of these members brought their families to New York or Philadelphia after Congress moved there? How much correspondence is out there to wives? I will tell you, Chuck and I went out and redid the search. We knew all the collections that had been productive when I went through in the 70s. So it didn't take that long. We only went into the collections of members so that we could get the letters written to their wives and family. For example, Representative George Thatcher, the first representative in the House from Maine, wrote his wife regularly. And she acted more or less as his home secretary. So his political friends in Maine would come to her to find out what was happening. So his letters to her are very significant. Of course, we don't, as is so often the case, have her letters to him because the Thatcher's children said, well, why would they be important? However, we can piece a lot of what she said from his responses. Well, we have dozens of letters, thanks to Chuck's input, that broaden what the First Congress attempts to tell. So that if you're interested in genealogy, family history, social history, that's all there now. And we collected until essentially we went to press with the last volume in 2016. Wow. It sounds like there is quite the assortment of letters and documents and a documentary history of the First Federal Congress, and that these documents reveal not just the work of the First Federal Congress but also the context for the people in that Congress and for the events that they lived and worked through. All told, do you have a sense of just how many documents make up the 22 volumes of a documentary history of the First Federal Congress? It sounds like there's a lot. Well, the correspondence volumes have 10,000 documents. Now, we didn't publish all of them. We published excerpts, the relevant parts, or in some cases, we summarized the letter but we had 10,000 letters to work from. It would be hard to estimate how many documents there are in the official records because, as I said, some of them are small scraps of paper with an amendment on it, but there are thousands. And there are also thousands of texts of the debates, but not as many texts of the debates as there are official records or letters. You said that you didn't publish every letter that you found, and most documentary editing projects don't publish every piece of paper or document that their editors find because they can't. They either don't have the funding or they found just so many documents that there's just no room or space to publish them all. So how did you and the other editors at the First Federal Congress Project make the editorial choices that you did? How did you decide what of the documents to publish from all these thousands of documents that you had to work with? Well, we published everything that related to Congress, even if it was repetitive because it came from a different source and wasn't verbatim the same. If it was verbatim, we indicated that it existed, but we didn't print it. We dealt with the large mass by excerpting and, in some cases, as I said, summarizing. So we didn't omit anything that shed new information on the first federal Congress. Now, we're on a quest to learn more about the Bill of Rights. And given your depth of knowledge of the first federal Congress, could you tell us about the creation of the Bill of Rights? Where exactly did the idea for the Bill of Rights come from? Because history credits James Madison with authoring the Bill of Rights, but Madison really doesn't seem to have been the first person who came up with the idea that amendments should be added to the Constitution. So, would you tell us what the documents of the First Federal Congress have to say about the origins of the Bill of Rights? Well, I'd have to go back and talk about what the Ratification Project says to answer your question. So let me just start by saying that during the debates over the ratification of the Constitution in 1787, and even to some extent in 1789 in the last states to ratify, beginning with Pennsylvania, which was the second state to ratify, the Anti-Federalists, the opponents of the Constitution, proposed amendments to it. 
They were not accepted by the Pennsylvania Convention, but Massachusetts' amendments from the convention were accepted by the convention. And New York went on to propose Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Rhode Island, all told several hundred amendments were proposed. About 100 of them were separate ideas, so there were many repetitions from different states. Most of the amendments proposed were what we call structural amendments, attempts to limit the powers of the judiciary, the executive, or Congress to protect the rights of the states. The minority of them were what we call civil liberties rights, what came to be known as the Bill of Rights Amendments. And all of the amendments were considered by Madison when he put together his proposal on June 8th, 1789, to the House, when he proposed a series of amendments. Now, Madison was very careful not to include very many of the structural amendments or include them in such a way that they essentially had no impact. For example, everyone cites the Tenth Amendment, all powers not delegated are reserved to the people or the states. Well, the language of the first constitution, the Articles of Confederation, said all powers not expressly delegated. Madison conveniently left out the word expressly. So because of uh, necessary and proper in Article One of the Constitution, if something is considered necessary and proper, even though it's not expressly delegated to Congress, Congress can go ahead and legislate on the matter. So Madison's amendments were almost entirely of the rights kind, not the structural kind. And his opponents, the Federalist Party in particular, ridiculed the proposals as being milk and water. Bills of rights are just useless. It's just paper. And Madison kept arguing, they're very important. That will be enough to get Rhode Island and North Carolina to ratify, and it will satisfy the majority of Americans who are anti-federalists. It won't satisfy the Hancocks of Massachusetts and the Patrick Henrys of Virginia, because they are the leaders of the states, their state political organizations, and they're going to lose power dramatically. But having once proposed these amendments on the floor of Congress, the House couldn't very well just refuse to consider them. It would have opened a horrible can of worms for the Federalist Party. So they considered them, and they modified them. The anti-federalists in the House attempted to get the House to agree to some of those structural amendments, which the House refused to do. During this whole process, the document, which is going to be adopted by the House, sent to the Senate, they're going to revise it, and then if the Senate is going to adopt the revision, the House will adopt that version as well. It's never referred to as the Bill of Rights. It's called the Amendments to the Constitution. Twelve were sent out. Two were defeated. So they became known in history as the first ten amendments to the Constitution. They became known as the Bill of Rights and the iconic document that we know it as in the 1930s. It was people like Representative Saul Bloom, the chair of the Sesquicentennial Commission, and other leading figures in the United States, many of them Jewish, who were horrified by the rise of Nazi Germany. And this is prior to the Holocaust. And on the sesquicentennial of the adoption of the Bill of Rights, in 1941, December 15th, Franklin Roosevelt addressed the nation on the importance of the Bill of Rights. And most of his address was an attack on Nazi Germany. So there's a very modern creation. So there's two creations. There's the actual adoption in 1789 by Congress and the ratification of 10 of those amendments in 1791. But your grandparents would never really have heard of the Federal Bill of Rights. It was only after the 1930s that they became important. 
I'm really curious about Madison's views on structural amendments, but I do think it would really help us here if we better understood the political landscape in the first Congress. So federalists and anti-federalists are terms that we see a fair bit when we study the early national period of the United States. But what exactly did it mean to be a federalist and anti-federalist in 1789, 1790? And where did James Madison fit within these groups? Somewhat complicated, but the easiest way to describe it, in 1787 and 1788, when the Constitution was being debated and in the first federal Congress, when it was being implemented, people supporting the Constitution took the name Federalist, and they labeled those who were opposed anti-Federalists, and that stuck. But the anti-Federalists said, no, you know, we're the Federalists. We're the true Federalists. We're the ones that believe in a balance of power between the state and the federal government. This new Constitution isn't Federalist. It makes the federal government supreme over the states. That's a complete revolution over the first Constitution where the states were supreme. And so the Anti-Federalists claimed not to be anti-federal, but that's the name that the Federalists successfully stuck on them. So opponents were known as anti-federalists from 1787 till about 1792, and the federalists, the supporters of the Constitution, of which James Madison was a leading one, were supporting the Constitution, and they continued to support the Constitution as they defined it throughout the 1790s until they were defeated by the Democratic Republican Party of Jefferson, which included most of the anti-federalists, if not all of them. Well, not all of them didn't include Patrick Henry, who couldn't possibly join a political party with Madison and Jefferson leading it. But it included most of the anti-federalists, and it also included the disaffected federalists, like James Madison, who left the Federalist Party in more or less clearly by 1792. But I would argue that he starts leaving actually in the first session of the first Congress, when Congress attempts to pass a bill placing the seat of federal government on the Susquehanna River. And Madison gives a speech in which he basically overturns what he had argued in Federalist 10 about size and the importance of the federal as opposed to the state. So what did these Federalists and Anti-Federalists in the first federal Congress think about the Bill of Rights? What were their general stances on the subject of constitutional amendments? Well, when Congress was debating the Bill of Rights, most of the Federalists were opposed, but they really couldn't vote against it in the end. The Anti-Federalists were definitely opposed, and they voted against it because it didn't have structural amendments that they sought. Yes. And speaking of those structural amendments, what did James Madison have against structural amendments to the Constitution? Because it sounds like the states proposed near 100 structural amendments during their constitutional ratification conventions. So why did Madison kind of ignore those amendments? Why did he prefer to add civil liberties amendments over amendments that would have amended the form and structure of the Constitution's government? The structural amendments would have crippled the federal government. They would have rendered the Constitution essentially what the first constitution was, the Articles of Confederation. It included things like limited terms for the president, strict limits on the judiciary, only those powers expressly delegated to Congress, very, very stringent limits on the power of Congress to tax or control interstate commerce. Now, to return to the origins of the Bill of Rights, what about George Mason? There are some scholars who claim that it was George Mason who was the real father of the Civil Liberties Amendments that became the Bill of Rights, not James Madison. So would you tell us about George Mason and what the records have to say about his involvement with the Bill of Rights? Well, he was George Washington's neighbor, like Washington, a fairly early convert to the fact that the only way to resolve the differences between England and the colonies was to separate from England. And the drive for independence 
was spearheaded by something that was referred to as the Lee Adams Junta. It was the Adamses, Sam, John, of Suffolk County, Boston, Massachusetts, and the Lees with the Washingtons and Mason of Fairfax County, Virginia. That was the radical hotspur of the revolution. And so Mason was very prominent in that in Virginia, and he was a vital spokesman for it in Virginia. He spoke at the federal convention on a lot of issues, very influential on the impeachment clause. But also, he's very important because at the federal convention, he attempted to get civil liberty amendments added to the Constitution before it was sent to the states for ratification. And the convention members defeated him, and he refused to sign the Constitution. When the convention refused to adopt a Bill of Rights and he refused to sign the Constitution, he published the very first criticism of the Constitution, listing what he thought was wrong with it. It wasn't just the lack of a Bill of Rights. There were structural concerns that he had as well, which he would have accepted if the convention had accepted a Bill of Rights. So he becomes the first and foremost spokesman against the Constitution, against its ratification as an unamended document. And he will go on to have other great and famous allies in the states. But he's the first and probably, in my opinion, the most significant. The reason that people credit him is because he was chair of the committee of the Virginia House of Delegates that wrote the Virginia Bill of Rights and added it to the first Virginia state constitution. Now, as a matter of fact, Madison was also in the House of Delegates at that time and served on that committee. So it was a committee that drafted the Virginia Declaration of Rights. And that committee was chaired by Mason, and that's why he gets the credit. So he is indirectly involved with the amendments that Madison proposed, but the amendments that Madison proposed were from those proposed by states in 1787 through 1788 after Mason had had his input. So Mason had no direct input into the amendments that were proposed in the first federal Congress. However, his influence in the history of the Bill of Rights is very important. So the document we know as the Bill of Rights was initially drafted by James Madison, and it comprises civil liberties amendments that Madison selected from a large list of amendments the states had submitted to Congress when they ratified the Constitution. Now, after James Madison went through this long list of state-preferred amendments, and he crafts his proposed list of amendments for Congress, What was the process like for Madison to get his proposed amendments through Congress? Painful, to put it mildly. He found a majority of the Federalist Party in Congress opposed to him. The Anti-Federalists, which were a very small minority, were unanimously opposed. And they had some allies in the Federalist Party who wanted structural amendments. And then he was really upset when the Senate went about cutting the number of amendments. Another big issue was Madison wanted to weave the amendments into the body of the Constitution and not have them appended at the end. Roger Sherman of Connecticut, Federalist, insisted that they be separate. So we really owe Sherman, who won that debate in the House, we owe it to Sherman that we have an actual group of amendments that can be called the Bill of Rights, because Madison would just have written them into the Constitution. So he had to fight to get the House to adopt it. He had to give up his idea of including them within the text of the Constitution. He had to give up some of his proposals, and he had to agree with the House when the Senate changed them further. One of the amendments that the House agreed to was, quote unquote, a separation of powers amendments. I'm sure you were educated just like I was, different generations, but nonetheless, we were all taught that there are three separate but equal branches, 
This is pure nonsense. They're not separate, and they're certainly not equal. The idea of separation of powers was a great dream of the revolution. Oh, we have to have separation of powers. Well, it didn't work under the Articles of Confederation. So the authors of the Constitution tossed out separation of powers for something much more significant, and that's balance of powers. So the three branches are balanced. The legislature and the executive have various controls over the judiciary, and they share certain powers. I mean, George Washington didn't hesitate to ask the chief justice of the United States when he was president to go on a foreign mission and sign a treaty with England. The Senate has executive powers. They ratify treaties, executive treaties. They appoint the individuals that the executive, the president nominates. The president doesn't appoint these people. The Senate does. So the powers are interwoven. I know there were a lot of people at the federal convention who would like to have tossed out legislative supremacy, but they couldn't. They couldn't get the votes. That was just too sacred, much more sacred than separation of powers. So the legislature is the supreme branch. And Congress has the power to abolish the entire executive and judicial branches overnight if it could work that quickly, except for a president, a vice president, and a Supreme Court of undetermined number of justices giving the legislature and the executive the power to increase the size of the court if it becomes far too liberal or far too conservative. And this has happened. The court has been as large. It started out as five and ended up as nine. But in the meantime, it had become 11 for a while. So the legislature is the supreme branch, but they're all integrated and balanced. And one of Madison's amendments was on separation of powers. The Senate just laughed at it and tossed it out. And it's not part of the first 10 amendments. Yeah. When we've explored Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence, We discovered that the Continental Congress went through Jefferson's document line by line and changed all sorts of language and punctuation, and Jefferson really wasn't happy with it. And it sounds like for James Madison and the Bill of Rights that this was a really similar experience. Oh, gosh, yes, absolutely. So what ended up being some of the most significant changes that Congress made to Madison's Bill of Rights? Things were dropped out. I've already mentioned the Senate defeating the Separation of Powers Amendment, the House defeating Madison's amendment to give Congress the power to declare state laws unconstitutional. There were a lot of changes, and they're all very well documented in the documentary history of the first Congress and in a separate volume Johns Hopkins University Press published from those documents called The Creation of the Bill of Rights. Do the documents have anything to say about whether there was a debate over the Fourth Amendment? There was virtually no debate whatsoever in the House on the floor that's recorded about the content. The debate in the House was about placement, the defeat of the structural amendments that were being proposed. So there is no debate at all about, you know, what this means, what the Fourth Amendment means, what the Second Amendment means. There's no debate about that at all. It's all about where they're going to be placed in the Constitution and why there should be or should not be structural amendments. Sometimes, as historians, we have to explain silences in the historical records, why we can't find anything about someone or something. Since you have gone through all of the documentation in the 22 volumes of the documentary history of the First Federal Congress, what do you think about the silence regarding the passage of the Fourth Amendment? What do you think silence from the First Federal Congress meant on this subject? The fact that they understood what it meant, they didn't need to debate what it meant. They'd understood that from English history. They believed strongly in the importance of knowing history. And English constitutional history was vital to uh, creation of the American Constitution. The Senate has come up a few times as we've talked about the Bill of Rights and the congressional debates surrounding it. You mentioned that when Madison's amendments came before the Senate, 
after they were debated and passed by the House, that the Senate made changes to Madison's amendments. And one of those changes was tossing Madison's separation of power amendment out the window. What other changes to the Bill of Rights can we put on the Senate? What other changes did the Senate make to the Bill of Rights? Well, they were significant, not only because they dropped certain things out, but they reorganized the House bill proposing the amendments. I think, if I remember right, the House sent 19 and the Senate sent back 12. Now, some of those may not have been things that were defeated, but that were combined into one amendment. But its process took place over June, July, August, and September 1789. So there's obviously a lot of documentation of what changes took place, even though we may not have much on why they took place. Do we know how the House responded to the Senate's changes to the Bill of Rights? Did the House have a problem with the Senate's reduction of its 19 amendments to 12 amendments? Not really. They were delighted. Anything to put the brakes on what Madison wanted because they couldn't do it in the House because if somebody wanted to speak against the Bill of Rights, these amendments, these civil liberty amendments, it's like attacking mom and apple pie. You don't do it. But in the Senate, where it met in secret, and we don't know what the Senate said because McClay, who kept the diary, was ill and he wasn't there. And he only reports that he heard secondhand this or that had been said on the floor of the Senate. But the House was delighted, except for one member in particular, James Madison, who essentially said the Senate has destroyed my amendment proposals, which wasn't really true. They did modify them, definitely. Earlier, you made a comment that the members of the First Federal Congress really knew their history. From all the different documents you've seen, do you think the founders or framers really thought about history and historical precedents when they formulated the United States Constitution and its First Amendments? Absolutely. No question about it. They cited history frequently. I mean, really remote, ancient history, republics that we never hear of today at all, unless we're experts in a certain field of history. But members of the Federal Convention in particular were all pretty well read in history, as were the leaders in the first Federal Congress. Now, there were some members of the House in particular, but even the Senate that were not well educated and not well read in history. But the majority were, and especially those who actually wrote the legislation and who talked about it. Oliver Ellsworth in the Senate and the Judiciary Bill that became the first Judiciary Act, where Congress said what the Supreme Court and the lower courts could or could not do. And that had a a relationship to Ellsworth's education, his understanding of history, and what kind of evils, if we want to call them that, British courts had done in the previous centuries. And I mean, back before the Tudors, as well as the Stuarts, which was, of course, the 17th century, when there was a real conflict between crown and parliament. And a lot of the history that cited comes out of that, because the generation that wrote the federal constitution were students of the Whig interpretation of history, if you will, in which the great course of English constitutional history is taking power from the crown, from the king, and giving it to the nobility in Magna Carta. And then in the 17th century, well, even before then, under the Tudors as well, parliament is beginning to demand more power and limit the power of the crown to the point that in 1688, essentially, the crown no longer really has a direct effect on legislation, even though it has to approve things. There was some times that people like uh, Queen Victoria actually intervened or caused constitutional crises because they wanted to assert the authority of the crown. Present Queen of England is very, very careful uh, not to get involved with that. So the founders were definitely a generation that knew their history and knew their history well. 
Can you think of any specific examples of how they used their knowledge of history to formulate the Constitution and the Bill of Rights? The fact that they made the legislature supreme over the executive is a prime example coming from British constitutional history. But don't let me leave the impression that they only knew English or British constitutional history. They knew Roman and Greek, and they even referred to what happened in the Ottoman Empire. Also, Egypt, which was just then becoming a thing. History of Egypt was not very well known. But you could sit down with the Declaration of Independence, for example, and see for everything that Jefferson listed in that part of the Declaration, which is an impeachment of the king, would go back to a specific event in English history where the crown did something. Obviously, Jefferson, just like Madison, was not able to include everything he wanted in his document. The Declaration of Independence, for example, did not, after Congress finished revising it, did not impeach the king for imposing the slave trade, which Jefferson had wanted. Ken, do you have any sense of the role that all the documentation contained within the 22 volumes of a documentary history of the First Federal Congress? how that's played in the ways that historians and lawyers have interpreted the Constitution and Bill of Rights? You did mention that the Supreme Court has made use of these volumes. Well, I think historians have pretty much come to accept that the Bill of Rights as we know it, or the amendments to the Constitution as they knew it, were not adopted because they were wonderful, but that it was a bitter fight. And the most common phrase used in 1789 to ridicule Madison's proposals and also the ones that were finally adopted was a tub to the whale. So that comes from a tale by Jonathan Swift that they all had read about mariners on a ship that encounter a whale, which starts to essentially assault this wooden ship by banging its head against it. And what the seamen did was toss a tub into the ocean, and the whale would then amuse itself with the tub because it could actually toss the tub up in the air and all kinds of things. And so Madison's amendments became widely known in Congress in 1789 as a mere tub to the whale, a diversion to divert the anti-federal monster and of no real significance. And I think that interpretation has come out of those documents that the First Federal Congress produced. Now, the Bill of Rights is both a historical document and a living document. What role do you think documentary editors and documentary editions, like a documentary history of the First Federal Congress, what role do you think these editions and editors play in preserving the Bill of Rights as both a historical document and a living document? Well, we publish the documents. We don't go on to explain what they mean. We leave that up to the courts, to the attorneys, to the historians. So we have basically two kinds of historical and documentary editions. We have the papers of an individual, Jefferson, Washington, Franklin, Adams, Madison, Monroe, to name a few of the major, most famous ones. But then there's also those that are themed such as the ratification of the Constitution. And if it weren't for documentary editions, readily available documentary editions, many of them online, we would not have been able to bring together all these documents from the disparate sources where they sit throughout the United States. But clearly, you can see from some of the documents where people say outright, you know, this will have to change over time. We have to amend the Constitution to bring the Constitution up to date with times. That It had to be a living Constitution if it was going to survive. And that was, shall we call it, the original intent of many of the founders, was to create a document that was very hard to amend, very hard to change, but could be changed when necessary, when clearly a majority of the people, majority of the states, wanted it changed and been changed many times. Prohibition, then rescinding prohibition, the right to vote for 
African-American former slaves, the right to vote for women, the right to vote for 18-year-olds, the idea that these people were naive enough to think that this document would not change or should not change is just ahistorical. Of course, they understood that it had to change. That's why they provided for amendments. If we didn't have these extensive documentary editions, what do you think that would do for our knowledge of history? Well, we'd have a very limited and uh, naive, mythical understanding of what happened. Now we have available as the sesquicentennial commission of the constitution wished in 1937 we have every single document published that we found robert morse of pennsylvania to james wilson 23rd august 1789 the house of representatives instead of taking up the bill for establishing the courts are amusing themselves with amendments to the constitution for which i blame madison but unfortunately, he got frightened in Virginia and wrote a book and urged our delegation to fix a day to take up the matter in their house. When we talk about the creation of the Bill of Rights, we're talking about two creation stories. The first is the story of the actual creation and ratification of the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. The second story is the creation of the name Bill of Rights. Now, the story of the creation and ratification of the first 10 amendments begins with the ratification of the Constitution in 1788 and 1789. Under the Articles of Confederation, the nation's first constitution, the states exercise more power than the national government. Under the new federal constitution, the national government would have supreme power over the states. So as many states considered and ratified the new constitution, they developed and submitted over 100 different amendments that they wanted Congress to take up and amend the Constitution with. As Ken related, most of these proposed amendments were structural amendments, amendments that would alter the structure and form of the Constitution's government. A minority of the amendments were civil liberties amendments, amendments that guaranteed personal freedoms and limited the power of the government from infringing upon those freedoms. Now, James Madison served in the first federal Congress. Madison convinced his fellow Virginians to elect him to the House of Representatives on the promise that he would take up the issue of amending the Constitution. Now, Madison served as the principal author of the Constitution. Like many Federalists, Madison believed that adding too many structural amendments to the Constitution would cripple its government. So after he was elected to Congress, Madison honored his pledge to amend the Constitution by going through all the different state proposed amendments and by focusing on their civil liberties amendments. Because civil liberties amendments promise to recognize the rights of the people without altering the structure of the Constitution. Now, Madison did include a few structural amendments in his formal proposal of amendments, but Madison made sure to include them in a way that limited their impact. For example, the Tenth Amendment states that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. The Tenth Amendment really just defines the relationship between the states and the national government, and it does so without really altering the Constitution. What the Tenth Amendment does is it confirms an understanding that early Americans had in 1788 and 1789, that all powers not granted to the new federal government would be reserved to the states or to the citizenry. Now, as Ken related, the process of getting Madison's proposed amendments through Congress was really rough for Madison. His fellow Federalists considered the amendments a waste of time a distraction from the real business of government. And the Anti-Federalists? Well, they considered the amendments useless because they simply didn't go far enough to amend the Constitution. Madison countered these arguments by stating that the amendments were important because the people wanted them and expected them. So the House of Representatives reluctantly took up the amendments to serve the will of the people. But as members of the House met in public, they didn't really alter Madison's amendments or make their opinions known about them. The House largely left alterations to Madison's amendments to the Senate, where members met in secret and could therefore talk more freely. In the end, the Senate reduced the number of Madison's proposed amendments to 12, and the states ratified 10 of them. These are the 10 amendments we know as the first 10 amendments or the Bill of Rights. Now, the second story of the creation of the Bill of Rights is how these first 10 amendments came by the name Bill of Rights, 
As Ken noted, the term Bill of Rights is a product of the 20th century. As the United States began to take a stand against the ideas of Nazi Germany, Americans began to look at the first 10 amendments and the personal freedoms they proclaimed. Now, a lot of what we know about the history of the Bill of Rights and its passage through Congress comes from the work of documentary editors. These historians go out into the world and collect all the documentation they can find by or about a specific person, place, event, or entity. And once they have all the documents they can find, documentary editors make editorial decisions. They choose which documents best serve the purposes they're trying to meet with their publications. And then they arrange those selected documents into chronological or thematic order, annotate the names of people, places, and events that are mentioned in the documents so those of us who use the volumes can best understand what we're reading. And once they do all of this work, they publish the documents free from interpretive commentary so other scholars and lawyers can use the documents and think what they will of them. Documentary editions like a documentary history of the First Federal Congress are really important. These editions help us understand the past so that we can separate what really happened from the embellished and mythical stories of what happened. And in the case of the Bill of Rights, the documents in a documentary history of the First Federal Congress reveal that members of Congress didn't think much of the Bill of Rights. They thought it was a waste of government time, but they took up the idea for the people and passed and proposed amendments to the states that really just confirmed understandings early Americans already had about their rights and the role of government. From all the documents in a documentary history of the First Federal Congress, we can see that the biggest accomplishment of the first 10 amendments, as far as Congress was concerned, was what these amendments did politically. These amendments allowed Madison and Congress to honor their promise to the people that they would amend the Constitution, while amending it in such a way that avoided really altering the Constitution's structure. History is the study of change over time, and legal history is the study of how power, authority, and governance have changed over time. What we can see from the history of the Bill of Rights is that the ways Americans have understood the first 10 amendments has changed a lot over time. Over the last 230 years, Americans have shifted from viewing the Bill of Rights as a political expedient to viewing the Bill of Rights and the civil liberties its amendments contain as a really important and critical part of the Constitution and their constitutional law. So how did we get here? This brings us to the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment doesn't always make headlines, but this amendment, which protects us from unlawful searches and seizures, undergirds foundational rights. It's also an amendment that grew directly out of early American experiences with English law and the American Revolution. Now, as Ken noted, no one in the first federal Congress debated the Fourth Amendment. They didn't debate it because everyone seems to have understood what the amendment meant and why the people would want it. But what does the Fourth Amendment mean? How did early Americans understand this amendment? And how did the Fourth Amendment grow out of their experiences with English law and the American Revolution? This is what we'll investigate in our next episode. Law is all around us. And this fourth Doing History series is dedicated to exploring the origins of the Bill of Rights and the Fourth Amendment so that we can better understand our rights and the role history has to play in American law. Look for more information about the First Federal Congress Project and its documentary history of the First Federal Congress, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 260. Joseph Edelman and Holly White of the Omohundro Institute's Digital Projects team have prepared some bonus materials for you to go along with this episode. Be sure you visit vastearlyamerica.com, where you'll find blog posts, a reference list of legal terms, bonus audio clips, and a bibliography of all the books, articles, and resources we used to craft this series. That's fastearlyamerica.com. I've put a link in the show notes and in your Ben Franklin's World app. As you heard, several podcasters helped me out by giving voice to several of the documents contained in a documentary history of the First Federal Congress. The part of Connecticut's Henry Gibbs was played by Jake Parker, host of the Pendola Project podcast. Andrew Moore was played by Joel Sharpton, host of the podcast Always Listening Podcast News. And Pod Vader Jay Soderberg, host of the Next Fan Up podcast, read the part of Robert Morris. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's Digital Projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Kayla Pittman, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, Ken related that anyone who's interested in the history of Congress, early New York City, or family history 
would find the documents contained in a documentary history of the First Federal Congress a great resource. So I wonder, have you ever used a documentary edition or documentary collection in your research? I'd really love to know which collection you use and about the information you found in it. So please let me know. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute, and production of this episode was made possible by a grant from the Roller Bottomore Foundation of Richmond, Virginia.